everybody's got a story. You just have to listen. Hola, I'm Joe Pardavila, and this is Good Listen, and we're wrapping up Season 1 with Mary Helen Bowers. Now, so far we've had psychics, drummers, actors, writers, therapists, influencers, and it's been amazing to hear all their stories. And Mary Ellen is no different. She was a little girl in North Carolina who dreamed of becoming a ballerina, and she did. She was so good, she trained Natalie Portman for her role in Black Swan. So how did this little kid from North Carolina become one of the biggest ballerinas in the world? Let's find out. Good morning, Mary Ellen, how are you? Hey Joe, good morning, how are you? I'm excellent. I'm happier now that you're here because I want to talk about ballet. And since you are, uh, you've been doing this for a while, I, if you're a good person to ask, because I'm always fascinated by how people find that thing. Um, so like I, I was very limited skills as a kid. I tried everything from karate to guitar. I, I couldn't, I couldn't find a thing that I was good at. I think luckily I could talk to people. So I, I, I stumbled into a career on that, but like the idea of like these and not the ballet's niche, but it's something that like you can't just walk down the street and find a ballet studio across the country. Um, so how did you first know what ballet was? Like, who was it? Your parents? Was it something that you saw? Because that's where I want to start. Like, how do you even know ballet is a thing? That's a good question. And and I was just absolutely drawn to it. My I don't come from an arts family. I don't come from a dance family. Um I didn't have stage parents or really like aggressive, you know, helicopter, tiger, tiger parents, like dance and ballet. I, I somehow or another found it and we can talk a little more about that. And I just, I loved it. And I was like, this is, this is what I want to do with my life. I just, I knew it and I pursued it and I had to, I had to really negotiate with my parents because my mom is a, you know, now retired children's librarian. My dad is a, certified public accountant like this is not it wasn't like they were out to raise you know a prima ballerina i just happened to be really good at it and and completely obsessed with that from the time i was pretty young do you know when the epiphany was that this is my life like not that you like love it because i'm sure as a kid you're probably loving the, the, the dancing with friends and and building this community but like was, was there a certain age where like Oh damn! This is I want. This is a career. This could or could be a career. Totally. As I got um, so the way I really got into it, I was around eight when I started. I had taken a class when I was little, maybe three or four, like a lot of girls do, a ballet tap class, and I enjoyed it. It was fun. I went once a week. We had a little recital. I remember being on stage and not knowing any of the steps, and like looking in the wing and watching the teacher and just doing. Who knows if I did anything? And you like. Now, as a parent, when I go to see recitals, like you see the kids like that on stage and I'm like, I feel, <laughs> I remember that feeling just being like, uh, you know, like struck in the, in the lights. Um, but when I went back that next year after I finished that class, so I was probably four, the, my best friend wasn't taking it with me and the teacher changed and I, I did it once or twice and I didn't like it and I cried and I was like, I don't want to do it. So when I later, I had a friend in my neighborhood growing up and we had a very, I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina, like really lovely, I, sort of idyllic suburban American childhood, right? Like riding our bicycles, going to the pool in the summer, riding the bus to school, just, you know, good Americana. And my, one of my good friends from our neighborhood was doing ballet and she was talking about it and kind of dancing around. And I saw her and I was like, that's, that's what I want to do. I, I, I just knew that I wanted to dance and I had to beg my parents to get into these lessons. And then as, as those lessons pursued, um, you know, it started like one class a year and I'm seeing now the same thing with my kids because we have three daughters and they're all doing ballet. So it's interesting now to have the perspective, you know, now I'm like a dance mom. Um, but I, I remember so well when I was, when I was doing it as a kid. So it's like one class a year, the next year, you know, if, if you're going to do it, like it, there's a progression and I'm sure the same thing is true of sports. The next year you're going two days a week, three days a week, four days a week. So by the time I was in, you know, sixth or seventh grade, I was there six or seven days a week, um, every single day after school for most of the weekends, because you're doing rehearsals, you're doing classes, you know, you're doing the Nutcracker, you're doing a spring show, you do a recital it becomes, you know, I think much like competitive sports, like a very consuming life. And, you, you know, I think part of it is that 
you have to, you have to really love it to want to do that. But that was around the time I'd say when I was like 12 or 13, when I was like, this, this is what I'm going to do. I love this. And I want to go to New York and I'm going to become a ballerina. It's crazy as that sounded. And, and you talked about your parents for having like from, from a white collar world, um, during this transition, when you were going from one class a week, I'm sure your parents like, okay, cool. We could drive her to class once a week. And then it becomes five and six. What was the support like at home? Were, were they like, yeah, let's go take you to the class, whatever time of day it is every day. Like what, what was the support or your family then? My, you know, both of my parents were working. My mom, so we, and, and most of my friends at ballet, frankly, they're, they, most of, most of those friends, not all of them, but most of them had but like, both of their parents worked too. So they all had moms that worked and basically they, we kind of formed a carpool system. So, you know, my friend's nanny would take us to dance and my mom brought us home and that was just how we did it, you know? So it wasn't as kind of crushing on one family or one parent because they sort of got together and, and pooled, you know, pooled their resources to do that. Um, and I think that made it a lot easier. And I will tell you, you know, driving our kids to dance now. I'm like, it'd be really nice to have somebody help on the other side. Like our kids are still too young for that. But yeah. but I can see that when they get a little older, you know, and I also remember like sometimes I would ride as I got a little older with one of the teenagers who could drive, you know, if there was a high school senior at the studio, she would, you know, and, the, and we were going to a different class across town or something, she would take us to that. So we definitely kind of came together as like a, a group you know, it's a pretty it's a pretty small group of people at that time in a city like Charlotte that were pretty serious about dance and doing it, you know, six or seven days a week. So you 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 make really good friends in, in that process. That's really cool. And it's so funny how striking it is to you now, because probably as a child, you had no idea that all there, there, there must have been this sort of like and this is pre, like, yeah, you know, dual calendar. But like yeah. the idea of like all these people coordinating all of this. And you as a kid, like, okay, cool. I, I got to class. My mom picked me up. It's all good. But now as a parent and you're, you're like, holy crap. <laughs> this is a lot. It's a lot. I mean, I think that there's a lot more involvement in from parents today. I mean, I see it even with our kids in school. Like, you know, they, they ask, like parents are much more sort of present, I suppose. Like, you know, our, I don't remember my parents like ever being backstage, right? They didn't, you know, even like one of our girls did swim team for a summer and it's like, like the parents have to volunteer. They have to show up. Like I, I really had no perspective on how like the commitment from the parents. And I don't yeah. think that, that was as true back then. Like, I don't know how things ran, but maybe there were two parents backstage with a couple, you know, a hundred kids or however many kids it was. But now there's like, you know, it's not a one-to-one -one match, but when I'm backstage on these recites, like there's a lot of parents wow. doing a lot of heavy lifting to make this stuff work today. So it is, it is a different, a sort of different model. Um, and it takes a lot, it definitely takes a lot of commitment from, from the parents and caregivers and, and the whole team to make these activities happen. It's a, it's, <laughs> it's a lot of work. As someone with no kids, like that's one of those, like but this whole idea of like their yeah. activities. Like I'm sure having a kid is really hard. I get it. But like <laughs> on top of this, like the stuff that they do, like totally. they like, don't want the kids. I don't you think know, it was like that when we were growing up, like they dropped us off, they picked us up. Right. You know, yeah. like they weren't, they, they, it wasn't like there were volunteer schedules. I mean, there were always a few moms that were like helped with costumes or were, you know, maybe, yeah. you know, involved, but everything was just, I think it was just a smaller scale back then, you know? Probably. Yeah. And, and you mentioned growing up in Charlotte and then deciding to say one day as a, as a preteen, I'm going to be a ballerina in, in New York City. Uh, now, it sounds like your parents were pretty supportive. What about that decision of being like, OK, you know what? As much as I love Charlotte, we got my friends here to be a ballerina. I got to go to the Big Apple. Yeah. So what, 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 how did that conversation go and what, what kind of struggle was that like for you? The model for becoming a professional dancer is that they're the big they're the big companies, national or international. I ended up dancing with New York City Ballet. So that's one of the biggest, most famous and most prestigious ballet companies in the world, right? I would say probably top three in the world. Definitely, you know, top in the US. And those companies have schools underneath them. 
and the schools are essentially feeders, right? So they bring in the most talented dancers around the country or maybe around the globe, train them, and then the sort of the best of the best from that group of dancers at the school goes into the company. And then the ones that aren't selected sort of fan out and go into other great companies around the country, or maybe they go overseas, or maybe they go to college, um, you know, and they, they, it was just something that they did very seriously, right, in high school. So I, the, and the way that these schools work, just to give you sort of like the big picture is they run during the school year, um, but they also, most of them have a summer course program. And the summer course is a way to bring in more people from around the country. So if you want to go to the School of American Ballet, which is the official school of New York City Ballet, so that's definitely number one ballet school in the country. And again, one of the best ballet schools in the world. The sort of entry point would be you can either go and try to audition for the year in New York, but you'll have to be, you know, ready to figure out how to live there and move there. But if you're coming from outside of Manhattan, what a lot of people do is go for the summer course. So it's a five-week program, and they actually tour around the country, um, and and all of the big schools do this. So they'll do to- like a, a, I think they call it an audition tour, right? So I would we would drive, you know, a bunch of girls from the studio. Somebody's mom would drive us to Winston Salem for the day because that's where North Carolina School of the Arts is, and um, the woman that was running. Their program used to dance with New York City Ballet. So they had a very good, North Carolina School of the Arts had a very good dance program. And all the big schools would audition there, by and large. So you drive up there and you can audition for the summer program. So the first time I did this, I think I was 12 and I was not accepted. Um, (laughs) But I actually got like a pretty nice um, rejection letter that I remember I kept on a bulletin board in my room for many years because it was like, you know, it wasn't just your you know, you're rejected. It was like, we see a lot of potential in you. um, And, you know, we would encourage you to come back another year. So when I was 14, I went back to audition. And again, I'm sort of just doing it in part. Yes, I wanted to go, but there's, you know, older girls at the studio who are a little closer to potentially pursuing a professional path who were looking at this probably more seriously than I was as just a 14-year-old kid growing, you know, in Charlotte. And so they they probably organized, you know, organized a trip. We're going up to NCSA, you know, to audition. We probably auditioned for more than one school. I can't really remember um, the details of it, but I imagine that we would have gone up more than, you know, for more than one school. But, but SAB was the one that I had my eye on. That was the one I really wanted to go into. It would be like if the Yankees had like, you know, a training school, right, for like 12 kids, 12 to 18, like. If you want to play with the Yankees, you're going to do what you can to get into that school. And so, you know, you go up in the summertime and that's, that's the way it works. So I was accepted the year I was 14 and my parents said like, well, you're way too young. Absolutely not. Like I obviously hadn't really talked it through that much with them and they were like, no. So they turned it down and I ended up going to a different school that one of my teachers in Charlotte was, um, had a good connection with. And worked at sometimes up in Chautauqua, New York, um, part of the Chautauqua Institute. So that's like way upstate New York. It's, you know, Chautauqua is like this, like small sort of artsy enclave. And they have a big summer, like people come in. I think they have the opera, they have the ballet in the summer. So they actually bring in dancers from like Mm -hmm. all over the world. And then they run a little bit of a, they run a little school. So it's a very nice, um, you know, there's, there's like a lot of wealthy people that live there. I guess people probably come in and stay in, you know, Airbnbs, but it was a small, a much smaller sort of scale, you know, you're, it's a gated community. My parents, you know, my teacher vouched for it. So they felt comfortable sending me there. So that's what I did that summer. The following year, I went back when I was 15 to audition and they pulled me out of the dressing room and said, um, the woman that was running the audition was in this older Russian woman named Olga Kostrisky, who later became one of my teachers. When I went there and she said, why didn't you come last year? I see you were accepted 
and you, you, but you didn't attend. What happened? And I said, my parents said I was too young. And she said, tell your parents you won't get a third chance, meaning like you come this year or that's, this is it. Like if wow. you turn us down, you're not getting invited back. That was the message. And so I delivered the message. <laughs> And when I was, you know, when I got the acceptance letter, which is sort of like, you know, these acceptance letters, like the, the thing I could liken it to the most is like, you're getting into it, like your, your college acceptance, like, you know, it's like, is it a skinny envelope or is it a little <laughs> bit thick? And it's got like registration forms and like information. And so, you know, every day you're getting off the bus, running, you know, running to the mailbox to see like, is uh -huh. are the letters here? Did I get the letter yet? Um, so when we got that letter that I was accepted, there really was no debate and off I went. So that was sort of, you know, I think my parents realized that they, you know, that I had this great gift and they, you know, they really did their best to be supportive of it and to honor it, even though, you know, I'm sure they still thought I was frankly a little bit young to be, you know, living by myself in Manhattan for five weeks in the summer at age 15. So tell me that setup though, because it sounds like your parents were slightly protective. So there's you're 700 miles away from home in, in New York City as a 15 year old. Tell me the tell me the parameters that they set up for you for your safety, obviously, because <laughs> they want their baby girl to come home. Totally, they have a very good setup now, which um, I think that it was built. You know, I went up there in the mid 90s, so this is probably like you know definitely part of your era of New York. Oh yeah life right like these were these were some good years we had some some of the golden years in new york in my opinion this um, is like the disneyfication of new york the 90s you know is a giuliani come in clean totally, it up yeah. it was getting cleaned up you know yeah. sniffed up exactly like so so the school of american ballet new york city ballet performs at lincoln center um on the if you're facing if you're facing the plaza you're facing the fountain the metropolitan opera house is behind the Philharmonic is to your right, and um, New York City Ballet, which used to be called New York State Theater, now it's called the Coke Theater, is to your left, right? So that's that's where we performed. In the back of the plaza, there's a little theater. I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, but they do Broadway back there. There's a really cool library, like a performing arts library, and then sort of up a set of stairs and over is the are the studios for the School of American Ballet. And that is also, there's a cafeteria and that's where the dormitories are. So they had built a dorm for the dancers and you're in the same building as kids from Juilliard who are obviously a lot older, right? Like Juilliard is a college. So, but they're on totally different floors, completely separated from you. You see them in the elevators, you see them in the cafeteria, but you know, I, I didn't really have a lot of interaction, frankly, with the Juilliard kids. Um, so you're a 15 year old kid, literally living in Lincoln Center. Like, it's not like you're living in, a, like, down the block, you know, Upper West Side. You were literally in Lincoln Center. So I'm sure your parents were like, okay, this is fun. You know, you're, not in this, right. you're in a dorm, so you have to show ID to enter, to exit. Um, they have a security guard. You have to sign in and out of the dorm. They have to give you permission, you know, like, if you wanted to go to the movies, if you wanted to go out to lunch, or, like, you know, like, we used to go – to FAO Schwartz, they had like, you know, and they, they would send like, here's all of the, here's all the activities you could do. Like I, we did every single one. If it wow. was like go to Ellis Island, I did it. If it would, I mean, <laughs> I saw so many Broadway shows that summer because they would take groups of us. So like we saw guys and dolls, we saw cats, like I saw Phantom, we saw every, like if, if they were playing it and they took a group from SAP, like my parents were, you know, they gave me the full experience. It was amazing. Wow. And in that first week at the, so my, we like, you know, they drove me up, I think on a Sunday to my memory in the summer, beginning of June, dropped me at the dorms, you know, here's your, here's your bedding, here's your suitcase, um, here's your dance bag, you know, we'll see you in five weeks and basically came back to get me at the end. I'm trying to imagine myself as a 15 year old, my parents dropped me off. Cause oh. I never did summer camps as a kid. Yeah. If I was a 15 and I was, I should mention, I was a scared little shit, but right. Uh, yep. If I was dropped off in New York City when I was 15 yep. years old, I probably would have had like some sort of conniption. I would have, I would have probably like just melted. What, what, what was your reaction as the, as you see them <laughs> waving from the car? Yeah, I mean, I was excited. I was nervous, of course. 
you know, it was a pretty good system because you basically like, you know, the dorms are in a separate elevator bank than the school, but you didn't have to, you know, in reality, you didn't even have to leave the building if you didn't want to. It wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, and Lincoln, that, that part of New York is really nice, as you know, those blocks yeah. right there. So it, it was scary. I was more scared, frankly, about like, you know, the class and sort of like what to expect, I think, than the That's than actually funny. like being in New York. Um, I don't even remember. Like, I'm sure so you know. Funny, like, had you a roommate. Must been, Mary Ellen, you must have been so advanced because, and, and for you to be like, I don't even remember being scared because to me, like me just imagining it, I'm scared. So that's just oh it. Just goes to show you your kind of mindset as a teenager and how focused you were. And so in Charlotte, uh, to use this parlance, you're oh, sort of like the big fish in a little pond. Now, yeah. yeah, you go to New York City. You said the mecca. It's the best dancers on the planet are there. Yeah. The best kids yeah. have been have brought have been sort of like driven all the way across the country to New York City. Um, yeah. what were those early days like? Because you know, I, I, people don't like to use the word anymore. But like, um, yeah. was there an imposter syndrome? We're like, oh shit, am I not good enough to be here? Is, maybe I'm really good for Charlotte, but not really good for for yeah. New York. I mean, well, it was I really like show us what you've got. You know, like nobody's there, nobody's pumping you up, nobody's pushing you ahead. And the the way that it worked is you have in that first week, you know, they basically had slotted you into a class based off of your audition. And I think, you know, they put me in a class and then they they bumped me up a level. I think they realized I was maybe behind my level. So they're trying to get you in the right level of class. But they're also, you know, that first week, every the entire staff is like observing classes. So you're in the class, you're working really hard, you're doing your best to, you know, prove yourself, to learn, to get better. The doors, you know, are mostly open. There might be other kids in the hall, but there's also a lot of staff that's coming through that's watching. You know, they have the clipboard, they're literally like writing things down. And I didn't even know enough to know that this is how it went. <laughs> I'd never really been to one of these big schools before, but at the end of that first week, they, you know, they ask maybe 20, 25 people to come back and return for the year. So that's- Within that first week? Yes. Whoa. Yeah. They can see it pretty quickly. You know, it's last year, I think, I don't know because- you know, nobody ever sat me down and explained it to me, but I think they're looking more at your talent and your potential than like necessarily the level that you're at. What is your work ethic? Are you serious? You know, they really want to see um, appetite, I think is one of the things they're looking at the most seriously is your hair, you know, so things that, that look bad, like if your hair is messy, right? Like, like, does your, is your hair neat? Like, do you have your uniform on? Are you on time? You know, and then from there, like, you know, that's the expectation, by the way. Like, anything yeah. else, by the time you get to this level, like, you, you better know how to do a proper bun and be on time, or you probably wouldn't have even gone in. Um, wow. So, like, you know, the baseline is already very high. And then, you know, then you just have to show up and do the work, basically. So... That's, that's really how it went. And then from there, you know, you're in class, you know, you're taking a couple of dance classes a day. You have technique in the morning. These are like hour and a half classes. You're doing point work. You're doing variations. I think I did a little bit of partnering that year for the first time, which is fun where you're, you know, starting to dance with the guys. And, and for a lot of them, it was probably their first time too. So everyone's sort of learning. Um, and, you know, and when you're, when you're finished, you're kind of hanging out in the dorms and we're going out on these field trips and, you know, doing activities. I mean, I remember almost getting hit by a taxi, like being just like not understanding how to cross the street, which you can imagine you're just like a dumb kid who doesn't know that like, yes, a taxi will run you over. Like you have to cross with the lights and all those sort of things. That's so funny. And so when you're in your early weeks, uh, you mentioned the fact that the bar's already set high. You, everyone's very professional at this point. Um, did you think you're like oh man there are other people just as good as me or better than me because you you would come from a place where you were probably like the star student the star uh, ballerina w was it intimidating to be surrounded by so many talented people or, or was it something that even drove you to become better yeah I think for me it was very encouraging because 
you know, you're like, this is, I didn't feel intimidated and I didn't feel insecure. I felt, you know, probably more motivated to work harder. Like you're like, this is, this is the level that I'm really supposed to be at. Um, and you know, so everything just kind of was like this really, really easy fit. The thing that was tricky for us with coming, you know, getting invited back for the year was we had to solve a couple of problems. Like you're going to live in the dorm, but the biggest one you could probably guess is like, what about high school? You're 15 years old. Like, you know, we're not going to drop out of high school. So the options then were basically, um, you can homeschool yourself from the dorms. Clearly <laughs> not a winner. Okay. No. And they're like, look, here's Janine. There was this one, you know, one student who was a little bit older than me, who was very successful. You know, she already graduated. Like she like raced through it. Like she was just a very, I presume type A person, you know, but they always held out like Janine is like the success story of homeschooling herself. My parents were like, that's a joke. That will never happen. Like, obviously. Um, so the other option was to go to the professional children's school, which is a private school. Um, you know, if you're ever up in Lincoln Center, you should walk down West 60th Street. It's on 60th Street. It's right across the street from Fordham Law School. And like when I was there, like Macaulay Calkin was there. Um, wow. There were a lot of kids on soap operas. And really talented musicians, like, you know, prodigy mus musicians that were attending Juilliard as, as children. There were, you know, like kids on Broadway went there. There were kids from School of American Ballet because you're, dan you're so serious about dance that you can't be in a regular school. And so that school was a wonderful resource and a great support because it allowed us to go to ballet. You know, I think we went and did a class or two in the morning and then we would go back to the, you know, go back to the dorms, change, run down to, run down to ballet class, change, grab, grab lunch in the cafeteria to go, run back to school, do another Jeez. two or three classes, back to the dorms, change really fast, go into your afternoon dance classes. You know, sometimes you had rehearsals and things like that after. So that was sort of the program. Um, and, you know, it wouldn't have been doable without, without a school like PCS. So it, it was really helpful, especially when, you know, I was 16 when they asked me to join the company as an apprentice. Um, and I got my contract shortly thereafter. So from that point on, that was basically the start of my junior year in high school. Um, I basically didn't really go back to school. I mean, I would go in because like s suddenly you go from just being in this very competitive ballet school to being in an actual like best ballet company in the world, right? Wow. No preparation, don't have a mentor. Like you're just like, you just got there by basically sheer force of will and talent. And, and it's like, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, but it's a little bit like the knives are out. It's not a nice place. It's not an easy environment. You know, it's not like the older girls are like, Hey, great. There's this really nice 16 year old. Isn't she nice? Let's help her out. No. It's not like that at all. You know, I got there. I didn't even know how to do stage makeup because I'd never done a performance at the school because I was there for such a short time and I wasn't in the professional class my first year. Wow. Um, so I like, I mean, I got there for my first Nutcracker and I was like, a friend had like taken me shopping who had done the workshop performance. She was a little older than me in an older class, a more advanced class. And she was like, well, this is what you're going to buy. And I was like, okay, well, somebody will show me how to do it. And they were like, You'll figure it out. Oh. <laughs> That's the environment that it was. So that was a big shock, as you can imagine. And they're just like, yeah, hope you hope you fail. That's kind of the attitude of the other dancers. I mean, it sounds terrible wow. to say, but it's true. And I imagine it's it's probably not that hard for you to understand. You're painting a bleak picture of because I didn't want to bring this up, but since you said it, like I I mean you of Black Swan, because I, I think for most lay people who have limited knowledge of, of 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 ballet they think of black swan and in that obviously there's like this whole yeah older ballerina battle against the younger ballerina you're saying that's pretty legitimate that's as, I mean, as much you know as they I like worked to on black swan right like i was natalie Strand. so i'm very familiar with it i love the movie you know yeah i think it's totally true to life if anything like there was one scene in that film where like 
Natalie's character falls on stage. And when she goes in the wings, she's like rushed by all these dancers. Like, are you okay? Are you okay? I mean, when you watch it again, you're going to see this scene. You'll, you'll remember this conversation. And I was like on set, I'm like, um, Natalie, like this would never happen. And she was like, you should tell Darren. I'm like, there's the director all on stage. Maybe your best friend, you have one best friend who'd be willing to speak to you and ask if you're okay. And everyone else would treat you like a leper because they, it's like con- a contagion. They don't want anything to do with it. Um, you know, and so like, you know, I told Darren, I was like, this is not realistic. You would need, I, I would recommend you change this. So he pulled, you know, maybe there's three or four girls instead of eight, like the first time they shot it. But I was just like, this is just, that's just not how it goes. It's not like they're out there like, you got this, you know, which is how I hear the girls at our daughter's studio acting now, which is a nice thing. I, you know, how much it's changed today, I'm not sure. I why? can't say but but certainly yes that was my experience wow well fast forwarding you you obviously become a professional you have this amazing career you 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 talk about the fact that you actually helped Nellie Foreman prepare for, for Black yeah. Swan tell me about the life of a professional ballerina was it what it you had hoped it was going to be I mean we mentioned some of the dark side about, yeah. about it but like was it was it as fulfilling was it was it what you wanted as that little you know 15 year old kid when you yes. first came to New York City Totally. It's a good question. Yes, absolutely. I mean, this is, this is an incredible art and you're performing it at like this outrageously high level. Right. So, you know, in retrospect, I wish that I had had more support and, and more preparation. Um, because, you know, I had a great career. Could I have had more longevity? You know, just like, I didn't leave for really physical reasons. It was more like I was just so burned out. Because it's really tough. It's really, really tough. And I found at a certain point, you know, you put so much, like a dancer's life is basically marked by sacrifice. And one of the reasons why Natalie was so good in Black Swan is because she worked so hard to prepare. Like we did five or six hours a day of training, six days a week for, you know, six months to 12 months leading into that, leading into that film. And and that was important because it helped it helped, you know, if you, if you're training, like she was working for a lot of that time on other movies, on other sets, you know, we were getting up the crack of dawn, going to it at, when she wrapped her day on set. And, and you have to really know and understand that like, this is all you do. You're not partying. You're not drinking, you know, beer or wine with your friends. Like you have room for nothing else. You have no life whatsoever. Your entire life is your art. And so when that art fulfills you like nothing else, it's 100% worth it. But for me, I found, you know, when I got a little bit older and the scale started to shift and I felt like I was putting in a lot more than I was getting out, that's when I was like, oh, this is, it's time for me to make a change. That was, that was my experience with it. Um, wow. Because it is just, it's constant sacrifice, but it shouldn't, you know, it, it shouldn't feel like sacrifice. I wasn't doing it because my parents wanted me to do it or because I was being pressured into it. I did it because it was the thing I wanted to do more than anything else. And I think that probably for most people performing at a really high level in athletics or, you know, dance or, or those types of things that that has to be true. It, it absolutely has to come from you. Wow. That is, uh, you mentioned the word burnout and uh, we the mental health aspects uh, of our society have, 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 have improved. Like, when I was uh, when I was younger, uh, maybe I'm a little older than you, but when you were younger too, you're probably like, oh, why? You know, put a smile on your face. You know, right. what? You know, what do we? What do you? Right. What do you what do? So, like, I think we're a little more yeah. self aware about yeah. mental health. Right. What's it like in your industry? Is are, uh, has it changed, or you're aware of it changing? Right. Where maybe the, so yeah. ballerinas are not burning out, or, or just are having I these. Hope so, you know, I'm not dancing professionally right now, so I don't know what the impression like on the inside, you know, like, does it look like it's changing on the outside? I think so. I hope that it is. I can say that like, you know, the school that our kids attend, I think that they really care. Like it's a really excellent school that's actually run by one of my friends that I used to dance with in New York. Um, And I think they really care about sort of like the dancer's whole health. And yeah, yeah, your mental health is a huge part of that. And as you probably know, imagine you've interviewed a lot of athletes too. Like, yeah. Mental health is a big part of, it takes a lot of strength, like mental strength, tenacity, 
um, to be able to perform at a high level in front of thousands of people every single night. And, you know, dancers are doing it, but, you know, the difference between dance and sports is that, like, professionally, you're not really getting paid. I mean, New York City Ballet takes care of their dancers probably better than any other ballet company. And I just mean, like, financially, you yeah. know, it wasn't like we were starving, but, and a, and a lot of dancers- Well, you couldn't eat anyway, Mary Ellen, so it's not like- <laughs> Well, sadly, but, but- you're you're not you're also you know you're not getting rich it's like you're doing it you're doing it because you love to so is it better you know is it is it an easier more open environment i hope so because it is very hard and and that that's just a part that's a part of it so you know for me what i'm doing now with ballet beautiful which is my fitness and lifestyle you know a lot of that initially is frankly just like a whole lot of healing that i needed to do with creating you know program that's about being healthy and strong and happy and using, you know, sort of taking, like I looked at the dance world and I was like, this is really messed up. I'm not going to try to change it. Like I'm one person. It's not like I, I'm here to like, I'm not like a ballet activist. Like let's revolutionize the dance world though. Now that I have kids that want to do it, maybe that's who I will it's become. Right. <laughs> it's a little, it's personal in a different way for me now, I will say, but I was like, you know what? I'm going to build this entire separate world that's going to, I'm going to take all the things I love about dance, the glamour, the artistry, the athleticism of it. And I'm going to, you know, build this like very healthy and wholesome kind of place that's about building strength and fitness and good health and longevity. Because I do think that that's something that, you know, is really missing from dance careers is that concept of longevity and you know that that we're taking care of our bodies like your body feels very disposable as a dancer and you just like beat the hell out of it until it doesn't work anymore is kind of you know the way it goes and that's not a way to have a you know longevity in your career and you know we want I want people to be doing my workouts when they're you know 80 85 years old like this is it for life this is how you train your body this is how you move your body it's a much more sort of gentle approach, like challenging, but, but like looking at it, like through a very long-term lens and dance is not like that at all. Dance is very like, you know, you're on stage tonight and, and how do you make that, how, how do you make that like your best performance? Um, so that's, that's something that, that I think about a lot and work on very hard um, in my own business every single day. Cause I think it is, it is so important. Um, let's, I want to pull a thread on that about transition, uh, cause you also talked about athletes there and w whenever you, you talk to athlete or see an interview, um, they'll say they don't miss the training. They don't miss the games. They don't miss the money. They miss the camaraderie. And that's right. why a lot of players feel they hang around because they're like, I don't know what to do in my life. If I'm not <laughs> around with sweaty guys, six days a week. <laughs> um, so what was it that you missed when you transitioned from full-time ballerina to entrepreneur running running this business. Right. Uh, was there something that jumped out? Although the camaraderie piece may be a little more complex. Because you mentioned the Unfortunately, you know, I hope that, I mean, certainly you had good friends, right? And you, yeah. you had, and you know, like I was in New York this, like last fall for New York City Ballet 75th. And they did a really nice job with it and bringing in, you know, bringing in so many of the dancers. And by the way, it's a small group. It's only like 700 people or something that wow. ever danced there. Like it's, it's a pretty small group of people. Um, so there is a camaraderie that I think, you know, you've been, you know, even if you didn't feel it then I, I do see it now. And I think it's wonderful. And, and that, you know, I see a lot of dancers trying to like respect and help, help some of their former colleagues, you know, with various things, but transitioning is hard. So I'd say for me, the thing that I missed is probably really the, the act of performing and being on stage and, you know, sharing, sharing your art at that level. Um, but, you know, would I do it today if I could? Like, I don't have 12 hours a day, you right. know, to spend on my body because that's what it really is. Like your body is your instrument. And so you have to spend so much time. So, you know, it's a very... And I don't mean this in a negative way, but it's just sort of the facts. It, it means that your life it, it like is a, a little bit of a selfish life because everything has to be about like, how do you feel? How is your body going to function? How is your body going to perform? Not like, can you show up for your partner or 
your parents or your kids, you know, everything is about like, it has to be because it's, it's just, it's so, it's so consuming. So it's a very consuming life that I think, um, that makes it harder for you to have, you know, maybe as full or rich of a, a life sort of outside of the stage. And I'm not saying that people haven't done it. And certainly some of them have and, and are and, and do it very successfully, but it's definitely, there's a, there's a conflict with that. And, and maybe with all art, you know, there's yeah. an element of like, you know, but I also, I also see it as like a God given gift. I think that, you know, we're given gifts. You, you were given an amazing gift, right. For, for connecting with people, for talking with people, for inspiring other people through that. And, you know, this, this is a gift that I had and, and pretty much anyone that's on that stage or on any of these big professional stages shares that gift. And it is a, a wonderful thing. So, you know, I, I also look at it as like, you know, we have a responsibility, I think, as, as humans to like honor the gifts <laughs> that we were given, you know, to honor, honor our bodies and, and our lives and hopefully each other too. I love so. that. And uh, talk to me about now the, what being an entrepreneur and running ballet beautiful does, what does that give you that right. ballet never could do? I mean, because it, it sounds like, you know, it's, you know, if anyone follows you on, on social media, you're having a blast doing, <laughs> what you're doing now. So yeah. obviously there's joy to it, but uh, outside of the, the actual joy of like having your business and helping people, uh, you know, find, you know, a healthier way to live through ballet. Um, right. what, what, what is it giving you now? That's a good, really good question. And it, it is interesting, like that, I think the transition from, from being a professional dancer or professional athlete to becoming an entrepreneur, for me, that gave me so much freedom because, um, as a dancer, it's like being, you know, a Broadway performer, right? Where you can't, you don't have that, you, you, you have control over your career, but at the end of the day, I couldn't be like, Hey, I'm going to cast myself, you know, like tonight I want to dance the sugar plum fairy. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't work like that. But when I started my business and I started setting goals and I started reaching those goals, I was like, well, this is awesome because I really am in charge and I have so much more power over what I can do where I can go and, you know, essentially like that, I think that's the wonderful thing about being an entrepreneur is that you really, you really call the shots. So, you know, like there's, there's really no goal, especially here, you know, we're very blessed to live in the U S where like this country supports entrepreneurs and that, you know, it's, I think entrepreneurship is a big part of kind of the American dream. And, um, you know, so I've been able to build a company and and hit a lot of those goals and share, you know, share share this workout and share this lifestyle with so many people. And also in a way that like I had four kids, you know, in the last 10 years. Like, so that's that's the kind of thing that would probably take you out of a professional workforce, you know, doing anything else. Certainly I wouldn't be able to be on stage every night right. and, you know, raise and, and manage and run a family the way that I do. Um, so it's, it's for me that I love that aspect of it. It's freedom. It's, um, it's the ability to, to like, there's the sky is the limit. It's, it's how I see it. And I, I yeah. just love that aspect. That's so cool. Um, so if the algorithm pulls this up, someone who's like researching ballet, whether they want to go into ballet or the, 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 yeah, children who want to go into ballet, what's a message for folks who want to make ballet their life's work like if someone is just like googling like how do i become a ballet dancer right. without giving us the walking us through the you know go to your local studio and all that jazz like what do what does it take to, to be yeah it's not easy ballet? like to to do to do anything well is going to take a huge commitment of your time right whether it's your studies whether it's your sport or you know ballet as a as a hobby or if you want to do it professionally like you have to be prepared to commit a lot of your time because you have to, you know, it, it's that, and, and dance in particular is the repetition, the practice. You know, I, I imagine it's similar to like doing drills in sports, but it's not just, you know, the time you spend in the studio. What are you doing, you know, outside of the studio? Are you doing your exercises to strengthen your core? You know, this is a lot of what I do now is, is understand, you know, I just, I, obviously I have a lot of, 
different perspective on things now that I'm in my 40s than I would have had, as you can imagine, when I was 16 years old. You're right. <laughs> we, we learn and we grow. So I think that that if you want to do it, you know, you you find a good studio, you know, there basically there really are no barriers when it's something that you really, really want to do, you will find a way to get around it. It is expensive, but a lot of, you know, ballet schools have scholarships. So I think you have to, you know, talk to them about that. Like there's, there's people that are willing to sometimes, you know, help out with that. I mean, I had to have scholarships once I went up to New York, it cost a fortune, you know, like I think my parents were doing okay when I was doing it locally, but Basically, all the money that they had set aside for my college went to my high school tuition, essentially, wow. like to pay the dormitory, even with scholarships. Like it still is not an, an expensive process. So, you know, yes, there are all of those barriers, but I think that that you just have to like punch through if it's something that you're really interested in doing. And I would say stick at it. You know, like I can remember having a teacher I didn't like or, you know, thinking, oh, I'm bored. I want to quit because I was maybe in a class that was too easy for me. But, I, you know, I, I toughed it out. I, I stuck with it. And and I'm very happy. I'm very happy that I did. And I think that was, you know, that was the path that I was meant to be on. So trying to tune into that, like, is this where I'm really supposed to be in life? I always think that that's a good thing to be. Great. Um, I hate I hate to ask women mother questions, but I feel like I, I, I you've opened yourself up to it. And the idea that you went through this ballet life and now you have these four kids who may want to pursue uh, being and you saw, you know, uh, you know, almost like you were you all, the way you described it, like you went to war. But like you <laughs> saw the kid when yeah. it came to ballet. Yeah. Does it worry you that your kids may want to follow your footsteps all the way through, not just now in their in their childhood, but as they grow older? Right. So, you know, our oldest is is 10 now and, and our three our three daughters are very talented. You know, baby brother, the guy's not even three years old yet. So, okay. Who so knows? Let's not talk about him. Let's talk about him. play lacrosse. Maybe he'll be an Olympic swimmer. I have right. no idea. Maybe, you know, maybe he'll be a radio star. I always like laugh. I think he's very musical. I'm like, he's like baby John Denver. Like, there you go. Who knows what he wants to do? And I don't know what the girls will ultimately want to do either. But I will say that they're very talented. And my feeling about it is if, they want to do it. I'm going to help them. You know, I know that like, well, one thing that was so interesting to me at the reunion that I went to for New York city ballet is like the people I used to dance with are now running these companies. Like all of a sudden I'm like, this is so strange. Like, because I, you know, you just remember being like kids backstage joking around, like just being dorks. And you're like, they're running like the greatest ballet companies in the world or the running the best schools. So it's like, we do have, you know, would I call on my network to make sure that like, not, not that my child gets a spot, but like if they do that, somebody is looking out for them. I think, I think you do. I feel a little bit better, frankly, knowing like one, I've learned a lot and I could give them support that I just never had. And, you know, I'm not criticizing my parents. It's just, you know, like it's not what they did. How, how could we have really helped me? Um, so, so there's that aspect of it. And then there's the people that we know that, you know, you would want to have, I, I personally feel much better knowing that I know the world, not that the world is dark, but that every profession is probably, you know, has darkness. I mean, I have friends that, that work in fashion. It's a pretty bad industry, right? But like, if that's your passion, you know, I would want to help them make it as safe and happy and successful, quite frankly, as I possibly could. Sweet. My name is Mary Ellen Powers. Mary, Helen, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. This was a pleasure. And that's a wrap for season one of Good Listen. I am Joe Partavilla. Thank you so much for watching and listening. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email at joepartavilla at protonmail.com. You can always connect with me on X, LinkedIn, or Instagram at Joe Partavilla or TikTok at jpartavilla. If you are consuming this on Apple or Spotify, it'd be great if you left a five-star review. And if you're watching on YouTube, I would greatly appreciate it if you could give us a big old thumbs up. I'll see you next time on Good Listen in the fall. Until next time, make sure you keep track of everything that's going on on my social media accounts. Plenty more content on the way. But until next time, adios.